guys for coming along um, this afternoon. Um, we're here, Dublin, Ireland, broadcasting to the world. <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, as you know, as a, as a community-based organisation um, working in collaboration with the probation service, we've been invited to um, by the um, International Criminal Justice Network. We've been invited along today to think about you know, our service uh, and how the pandemic has affected the, the service that, that each of us work in. And uh, before we talk maybe about the pandemic and how we had to reshape and remodel our services, um, maybe I should say a little bit about what this service can do, community trust is, um, that we're part of and, and, and what exactly we do. So let me first of all say that I'm joined here today by three of my colleagues. Uh, you have Dervila there. Um, if you want to say hello, Dervila. And Alison. Hi. And Tom. How you doing? And the four of us, we work together in Pandal Community Trust, as I say, in a, a place called Bally Firmament in Dublin. And we're also joined by Kira O'Connor. So Kira is a senior probation officer working with young people's probation. And in line with the Child Care Act of 2001, that act wanted to try to look at young people and see if we could provide responses in the criminal justice system that were more in keeping with young people and their developmental stage and try to port them, if you like, to orders like training activities order, community service, these kind of orders to see if we could help them to grow and make a different choice in their life than going down the cycle of um, of offending or, or, or destructive behaviour. So CANDLE is one of those local organisations that the probation service refer into. And we provide uh, things like educational services, um, which are accredited. We provide developmental services for a lot of work done, mentoring, advocacy, one-to-one. -one. And we offer only over the last few years, but and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, our therapeutic services. And I suppose what we strive most of all is to provide a context where the young people can come. And, you know, they're at such an important point in their life in these teenage years where they can grow and, and develop a little bit and begin to make some good choices for themselves and I suppose become active citizens into the future in their own communities and in society in, in generally. So that's what Candle does. Guys, I don't know if you think that does that adequately give a picture of what we're what we're what we are and what we do. It sums it up, it sums it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I suppose another aspect just at the beginning that we want to think about, and maybe Beverly, you can you can come in on this particularly, is that I suppose over the last number of years, maybe five or six years, we began to notice that while the international evidence said that youth offending was on the decline, we noticed that a lot of the young people who were presented, presenting and, and being referred to us that there was ever greater complexity in the kind of issues and in the lives that they were coming with. And that while there were fewer people maybe offending, um, the kind of levels of um, issues and struggles that these young people were coming with were, were of far greater in, uh, complexity. And, and that really struck us in Canada in the sense that if we didn't try to look at this and see how we were going to respond to that complexity, then trying to do stuff like education or developmental work with them really wasn't going to hit the mark. And what we slowly, maybe, but international evidence supported us in really understanding this, we began to recognise relational and developmental trauma in the lives of these young people. Um, let me just put it like this. We have 16, 17-year-old young men, almost, 
young teens, late teens, and they come in and they're physically really big guys, you know, and often, and we can think that, well, we can talk to them at the level of them being a 17-year-old, but what we began to see is that because of the trauma in their lives, actually developmentally, they were often way back maybe at the age of four or five. So if you can imagine having a four or five-year-old and trying to talk to them about having empathy for a victim or to talk to a four or five-year-old about making good choices in their lives. I mean, they're just not at a place where they could do that. So it didn't make sense. Right. Talking to these 17-year-olds who have these physical bodies, but actually emotionally, relationally, they weren't in a place to receive. It's because of trauma. We really started to think about trauma and its effects and how we might begin to work with the trauma. So we, we started on a journey of becoming what we call a trauma-informed organisation. So, Dervla, you know, you've been very much part of this journey over the last number of years. Maybe, maybe you'd like to just share with us a little bit about, you know, what your understanding of being a trauma-informed organisation is. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I suppose you've been listening to you, Brian, about uh, talking about the, co- the levels of complexity, even in that international thing. A lot of the young people not only uh, presenting with us that, that come to, to our service are coming from probation, but also on the edge of care or in care. So that is another layer, I think, that you can see how much we needed when we see that, how much we needed to, to respond to them. So as, as a trauma-informed organisation, a lot of the training we've done around, around that is um, what they would call the four R's. And the first of that is to realise the impact of the trauma has on the young people um, that are in our care, um, the, the levels of stress that that has, the adverse effect it has on their lives and, the, and their development. Um, and But also at the same time, recognising the, the power and the potential to heal and to recover and to grow to their full potential. Um, very important, um, I think, as you know practitioners and um working with young people such vulnerable young people we need to recognize the signs and the symptoms getting to know the young people well not only in how um it impacts on the young people themselves on their you know that maybe they're presenting with challenging behavior but also how we respond and how it impacts on us so there's a lot of work that goes around that i suppose creating a, a reflective loop um really important piece um i think is that we have as a team we resist re-traumatizing young people and that's across all all services that we're very aware um of like i say recognizing the signs and symptoms and making sure that we create an environment for a young person to come into that won't re-traumatize them as best as as best as we can facilitate that and then finally the final law is responding in a really meaningful way um, where you integrate the knowledge that you have around trauma, understanding where it's coming from, um, and realizing in an organization how, as a team working together, we can create a culture that is knowledgeable, integrating therapeutic interventions, developmental programs to ensure that we're res- responding in a really fully, fully and meaningful way to a young person's needs and that complexity we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And and as I say, that's a journey that Handel has been mm. on and we've been on together as a team. Um, mm. And I know that, you know, it's it's really impacted on how we have started to shape strategically our organisation, like our training. For instance. Mm. We've, we've done a lot of training. Um, we with, have. Over the years in, in a model called the trauma recovery model. And we've also just reshape our whole building. Do you want to say something about that? Just maybe. Oh, absolutely. Like I think we've done, yes, a, a lot of training, especially over the last six months, we probably talked about, but, or talk about, but, you know, even before that, I suppose in this, as part of this journey, I suppose we realized that the, building itself that we were working from wasn't really fulfilling the needs and meeting the needs of the young people and we were expanding as a service too so i suppose 
we, it was very fortunate that we had done done some work around recognizing trauma that we were able to put our knowledge of that to um, inform our architects to talk about um, we had the language of trauma, but to get them to understand what a space needed to be, to be a trauma informed space and environment, um, literally into a place that a young person can feel um, that the space itself creates a sense of calm, that it's welcoming, um, that every aspect of it is talking to that, that um, sense of security and safety. Um, and also, I think in that youthfulness, because we're working with young people, you know, that we there's no clinical side to this because sometimes we're talking about trauma and it's very, it can be theoretical and things like that. But this is a physical space that embodies what we're trying to do. And I think we're very fortunate that the building we have now, it says it all, you know, mm. and it makes it easy. It is actually an easier space to work from. So, so I suppose over the last few years, that's just really to give people an understanding of mm. and what we do and how we have developed a model of practice, both with trauma recovery kind of practices and also uh, restorative practice models that we use. Mm. So Kira, as a, as a senior probation officer who refers into Canada, maybe just talk a little bit about the relationship of Candle and the probation service, where that fits in? I suppose the probation service would fund a lot of CBOs, as you mentioned, Brian, nationally. Um, but I suppose what's what's different about Candle is it would deal with most of our young people and young adults um, in this area of the, the city where Ballyfermot is. Um, the relationship is is very important because the probation officer will have certain obligations, you know, to make sure that a young person is complying with their order um, and that certain risks are addressed um, along during that time, really. And a typical probation order would be about 12 months. So once we have a young person um, placed on an order by the courts, um, we're looking really to reduce offending behaviour. But in order to do that, as you both kind of mentioned so was it's about addressing some of that trauma, uh, because what comes from that trauma seems to be certain um, antisocial behaviours resulting in crime, yeah. um, you know, drug, alcohol misuse. So really what we're looking from from this CBO is some responses that will help us really help the young person um, address the problematic areas of their lives. Um, and with the result being that life becomes better for them and better for the community. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and a really close relationship with not just funding, but with, with the probation officers on the ground referring in and that collaborative piece that we do. So I suppose that in maybe a sense of Candle as an organisation evolving over the years. Um, and uh, we were going along merrily along like every other organisation until March uh, 2020. And then, Tom... Tell us what happened and <laughs> what you saw as the effects of that yeah. and the COVID pandemic hit. Yeah, it was bad. It, like it happened overnight nearly. The impact of it was just we were thrown down to deep end nearly and going, what do we do? Um and and, and as Jared was spoke about all those things about yeah, the importance of trauma and security and safety and the building being a welcoming place and all that all that work we put in place. I got taken away. Um, we 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 re, we moved into the online world, um, and then as Kira spoke about uh, just there about how trauma would be one of the underlying causes for the causes of crime and antisocial behaviour. Again, we're thrown into this the impact of of COVID. And if I stuck like I think of the ecological model of and Brenner, which kind of has the individual in the middle, you know, that the circles, yeah. and family and community and the school and then society. I think every aspect of that has been impacted when you think of it, of the risk and protective factors. So certainly when you see, when you think of the economic impact that it had on young people in terms of their, their parents or maybe brothers or aunties and uncles who maybe had jobs and uh, in retail and hospitality or customer, those jobs are gone nearly overnight. That adds another economic pressure, pressure into the household. And, and, and put a trauma lens on top of that. And, and think about 
the reality of that, the pressure in, in, in that. So there was a pressure cooker. It was like the perfect storm I could I think of as well. If you think of their formal education as well, an aspect in their life that not only provides them with their formal education, but lots of other benefits like social interaction, structure within their, within their day, that's also cut. It's put online. And, you know, just from knowing, um, from working with young people, they weren't engaging on online resources. Yeah. There was certainly an impact, you know, in terms of did they have laptops? A lot of them just had internet on their phone and things like that. So it was certainly that. And then structure went out of their day to some extent um, and they're staying up late at night. And, and, and these are the basic, like, uh, when, you, when you look at uh, usual fending, it's did I have education, did I have structure in their day? Even the stuff that they really enjoyed, their hobbies and interests, you know, like football and the soccer teams, that was all cut as well. So there you have all these risks and protective factors are all impacting. You also have an impact on their health. So there's this social isolation. Now, don't get me wrong, some of them were delighted to be off school, but that didn't mean it didn't impact them being socially isolated from their normal friends, maybe smoking weed a bit more in their in their rooms up late at night. That affects their mental health over time. And I think, in fact, um, it's funny when I think about it, is um, initially I, I do feel they were delighted they were off school. But the duration of this um, pandemic had an impact. That over time, they wanted back their structure. They wanted to get back into Canada. They wanted to get back into school. It was going on too long. Uh, and and mm -hmm. You could see the impact, and you definitely seen an impact on increased substance use, and we, we've seen issues of uh, domestic violence uh, in the home. So I suppose uh, to sum it up, in, in, to some extent, is the moment we needed our service the most, there was restrictions upon us as well. But I think throughout the twelve months as well, um, I think the government realised that the importance of our services and we became essential services. We weren't in the first lockdown it was more online, but then we were seen as essential service and we were able to work with the most at risk. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But when you're talking about the protective factors when they were taking taken away. And Alison, you do a lot of work um with the young people, you know, in, in kind of one-to-one -one small group settings and, and mentoring them. In terms of what you saw happening in their lives. During during those early stages of COVID and right on, what 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 were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think for all of us, I suppose, and um, we all kind of knew what was happening over in China and across the world um, with COVID nineteen. Um, but I think it came to a shock to all of us. I think how quickly it happened here in Ireland. I know definitely for the young people, you know, there was a lot of talk about it um, before um, the announcement came that we had to close. And I suppose there was really you know, it happened really quick and there was a lot of panic in the air. The young people were quite scared and confused. I remember one young person in particular talking to me about it and really reflecting to me that the adults in his life could not provide him with any sort of reassurance that everything was going to be OK. Like they didn't know what was going to happen. So how could he be OK in a sense? And I think that really resonated with me, even as our service um, moved forward, that you know, he was in so much turmoil and distress about what was actually going to happen. Were people going to die? Were people going to live? Were we, was the health system going to be absolutely overrun um, because it was out of control? Like what was going to happen? And I suppose we could only provide him with a little bit of, you know, hope and saying, well, hope, we hope it's going to be okay. You know, you have to go home. You have to do what's asked of you. Um, but we honestly didn't know ourselves whether or not things were going to be okay. So I think that uh, from the initial stages was just a, a huge thing for young people i think you know not being able to be reassured by safe secure adults in their life that everything was going to be okay was just didn't provide them with very much hope and i think um in terms of emotional needs you know that was really the start the start of the difficulties that we started to see and experience really on a daily basis i suppose for the young people, they lost an awful lot. There was this sense of fear in the air that really took over and really affected them. Um, and I suppose they lost their routine. They lost any stability that they had in terms of their lives. Like a lot of the young people we would work with 
do come from, you know, very chaotic lifestyles at times. And I suppose our service a lot of the time is that stable place to come to, is that routine, is that structure that they so so need, you know. So a lot of that, all of that was taken away, I suppose, in the initial stages. And I suppose it affected every young person very differently. Some young people, you know, they, as, as Tom said, you know, they were happy, they were great, you know, were locked down. Um, but for other young people, you know, it was it was really concerning because they didn't want to go out of the house. They didn't want to go over the door. Um, a lot of the young people struggled with drug and alcohol misuse, using, using drugs and alcohol to cope with what was going on outside to kind of block out the reality of the situation and the fear of the situation. And I suppose for a lot of our young people, especially who would be known to the likes of fear service, um, they were really reflective about how they, how much they struggled and how you know, they find losing their routine so difficult in terms of trying to not engage in offending behaviour. Um, and they had, like a lot of services were, you know, remote or had had to change because of COVID. And that really, I suppose, affected them in terms of their ability to be able to stay out of trouble because um, coming to yourselves kind of took them out of the equation potentially of offending for a couple of hours a day. Um, and they had engaged in positive activities. So that was a really big, big thing for them and um, I suppose in regards to parents and communities parents struggled with having their children at home all the time trying to keep them in the house trying to keep them safe when they wanted to be out and about the financial implications we, we came across huge amounts of food poverty huge huge amounts of financial strain for families really struggling in that situation and um, to try and cope and manage their kids and manage feeding them and manage even on a small budget if they'd lost their job as well and I suppose within that you know we would have been quite aware of parental alcohol misuse parental drug misuse mm. as an effect of the pandemic as well so it was really it really felt that they lost an awful lot and I suppose in terms of even the community and um, you know the community that sense of community was I suppose taken away because everybody was told to stay in their own houses and not socialize so generally they've lost they lost so much and I suppose the young people that we work have, are already, I suppose, marginalised in a sense, so they really suffered suffered the most from from the get go. So they did. Um, yeah. uh, you know, when you paint that picture, Alison, and it was a picture that, you know, as we went through those early months, really as a team in Candle, yeah. really struck us to an extent that we said, you know, we cannot sit back. Mm. And I suppose our first step, so let's talk now about you know, what did we do? How did we respond to this? And I know our first step was uh, advocating to become designated as an essential service because most services were closed and most services were told to work from home. We knew, as what Tom was saying, the online stuff really wasn't working. Um, the isolation was growing. And we felt we had to get some in there opened in some way again. So by being designated in early June as an essential step, critical for us, like beginning to reach out. Dervla, as the coordinator of therapeutic services in Campbell, maybe you could say how the therapeutic services as an essential service responded. I suppose we were hearing all the time from young people that were um, engaging on online counselling how much they needed to engage face to face and in fact how they were disengaging when they were online. Um, we were very aware of any contact we had even just with, with our young people how, how much they needed that kind of crisis intervention in many time in many places. So we were that becoming and being, I suppose, recognised as an essential service to do that crisis intervention piece really was what was crucially needed for the therapeutic space. We were able to offer what face to face counselling from the 29th of June, and that's been ongoing. Um, just even, you know, I suppose we really were thinking along that all the time doing our risk assessments. What can we do sticking with it, staying within government guidelines and knowing that we could create a safe and safe environment for the therapist and for the young person alike. Um, and it was phenomenal, the response. Um, I suppose in the therapeutic space, we would initially have that uh, 
counselling and a couple and other therapies, in fact, in place. But counselling was the one we focused on um, putting in place for young people. So doing all that support to kind of make sure that the young person was able to make their um, their their session was really important. But within that, I suppose a lot of the stuff that was coming up was an added kind of. Um, sense of uh, stress and anxiety there, were, there was really although they'd been working through an awful lot of stuff with their therapist first a, a, another layer of issues were coming up as a direct response to covid and i suppose our understanding really our understanding of kind of working through the whole lockdown with young people and listening and talking we recognized that i suppose we had a moral obligation to really provide services to young, to the young people who don't necessarily access our service but open it up to the wider community um and in doing so we we sought some funding and got it and managed to um create a new a new service called the support hub and i suppose during the during the early days of the pandemic we actually doubled our um therapy that we're offering to double our client group. So if we were having half coming from the community and half the young people that access our services. So it was one service that we have in Candle that we were, while we were locking down and so many others around this, we found we had to expand out and really um, support other young people. And it was an interagency approach um, and into the community and we've been able to continue that. Um, but it was a vital, it's a vital service. You know, I, I think there were very, some very desperate parents and young people out there crying out for support. And I suppose we were able we were able to provide that and more. Yeah, yeah. And as you said there, Dervin, I think it's so true that in while some services had to close, in, this is one particular service doubled in terms of during COVID. It it doubled its number of young people participating and it reached out to the wider community. So it was really mm -hmm interesting response I think and Tom you you, you uh, lead out the youth service which is a more non-formal education kind of mm. youth service activity do you want to tell us what what your service did to respond uh, to the COVID need of young people yeah as you say Brian I, I suppose I run, we run a, a youth work service which is very much voluntary uh, basis and it's like a youth club you know um, and we do target uh, particular young people from lower socioeconomic group or from early school leavers, um, young people involved in crime and um, uh, young people struggling with mental health as well. Um, and I suppose the way we operated before COVID hit is, yes, groups would come in. We'd have big groups, some drop-ins of groups of 20 young people together. And that was an opportunity for them to socialise with each other and do various activities as well. And then we'd have smaller groups as well. So all of a sudden, overnight, um, we were we were put into this online world and we had to upskill ourselves to some extent in terms of using Instagram, using Zoom. Obviously, we used phones and we used on post as well, and postal service. Um, so um, in terms of using Zoom, we, we had to get used to that te technology. The young people were very clued in on Instagram and things like that. They knew um, messaging, and we also used Facebook as well. But I think Zoom was uh, the most important, where you got that more face-to-face -face interaction. And, um, like, central, some of the principles of your work is that the relationship with the young person is central to the practice. You can build a relationship with the young person. You have that trust. From that trust, you can open up conversations with the young people with the challenges they're facing. Um, maybe it's got to do with school, maybe it's their mental health, or they'll open up to you, you know. So that for us it was fundamental to maintain that engagement with the young people throughout this pandemic. So engagement was the key word, keep them. And, and another important principle of youth work was meeting young people where they were at. And where they were at sometimes was just to have fun to interact with their peer group and just to have a bit of a laugh. And then others wanted more. I, I want to talk to you personally about my mental health or whatever it may be. But yeah, so when we started the Zooms, you know, we were doing art via Zoom. Then we got into these quizzes. 
But we really, like, it was still a real challenge to engage the most vulnerable, I have to say. We started doing incentives then via Zoom. So say we had a quiz or something, and we we would advertise the winner of the quiz would get a pizza delivered on the night and things like that. So we had to be creative in that sense. Um, And that created a bit of a buzz as well. But again, when you think about the most at risk and most marginalized of a group, one or two or three weren't attending that Zoom, you know. So that was always an issue throughout. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, as, as we went on, I, like we also posted out activity packs to families, you know, art supplies and all that sort of stuff. Um, Instagram, um, we were always messaging, keeping the engagement going, and then phone calls, checking in with um with, with parents and that sort of thing as well. Yeah. So, so that was true, but I suppose that was the first three months. And as we um, we, we got the status of an essential service, we could then meet the young people. And I, and I have to say, you only realise the importance of that face-to-face interaction when it gets taken away from you. Just those little bits of them actually getting structure in their day where they actually come and they go somewhere and they go to Candle. But I always see Candle as a, like n- nearly like a little oasis because of the nature and the trees and the flowers and the therapeutic gardens that surround Candle, never mind uh, the building itself. Um, I thought that was very important and very interesting. And there's something about um, being in the same space as the young person as well. It's not that when you're in Zoom, you nearly have to be talking all the time or, you know, but um, to some extent, you're in... the the same physical space. You don't always have to talk. You can just watch uh, the world go by sometimes while you're with them or play pool. You don't have to talk all the time. So uh, that really emphasized, particularly in the lens we're working in a trauma-informed approach, that mm. aspect was very, very vivid for me then, the importance of that, you know. Um, and then I suppose it, it came to a point we had to work. We we had to choose who are the most at risk to work with. We had to choose nearly the young people. We had to work with uh, as an essential service. And instead of working in maybe groups of twelve or groups of twenty, we are down to working with groups of three and groups of four. Now that very much changes the dynamic of how you work. Mm. You get a lot more, I guess, trust in the group, more honest conversations about what's going on in their lives. Um, and you do. You also, as a, uh, as a youth worker, as a practitioner, you also have the space and time to have those conversations. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, throughout it, we're always, you know, making it as engaging as possible. And we do use different mediums of cooking, you know, while we talk to them or art or sport. Um, and, and there were certainly restrictions within that because all of a sudden now you have a mask over your face you have to be two meters back, and everybody has to be two meters. And that had its uh, challenges as well. Yeah. Um, but look, lots of conversations came up um, of the stresses they were having during COVID, whether parents are un- uh, unemployed, whether there was domestic violence in the house, or even just um, information on COVID, like clarifying some things. Um, yeah. Because a lot of the news they were getting was from social media and stuff. So it was good to uh, just challenge some of the, the, this thinking around it, you know, that it, it might be a hoax or why is the government doing this? So just have those discussions to help them understand as well, you know. Um, but it, but it, it was it was an interesting experience and we're still going through it. So I don't think we know the full fallout of it, but it did, it did cement the, the understanding that I always knew anyway, that we were an essential service in society and how important that service is um, Absolutely. for young people, you know. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, some really powerful points there, Tom, you know, mm. as I listen to mm. you saying it. Just, Alison, um, in, in Candle, you kind of come at the heart of that kind of developmental work and educational uh, sphere. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that, and and we'll come to Kira to 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 finish up because I'm conscious of time. But so yeah, just from that point of view. Yeah, um, I suppose because um, we've done a lot of training in the area of trauma informed practice and approaches, 
I think that made us very different in how we kind of started things when everything closed down in March. I remember um, when it happened in March, thinking, oh, we'll only be out for a couple of weeks. And um, all the staff were running around putting work packs together and thinking, oh, we'll see you, we'll see you in a few weeks kind of thing. Little did we know. Um, but I think that because we came from the trauma-informed approach, we really realized how vital it was that we needed to continue to engage with these young people and how important it was um, for them not to be allowed to drift or disengage. And I think because we we understand kind of things that they've been through in the past, we knew that this the, the whole COVID issue was not going to be easy for any of them. Um, so I think, you know, back in March, it was very, it, it looked very different, I suppose, from what it was in August, September, and even what it was now. Um, so initially, we did a lot of work packs, art packs, you know, we were setting up Zoom classes for the young people for their educational um, aspects. You know, they were having daily contact with the teachers and we were sending things out to them on a weekly basis and just really trying to engage them. And I think it was a, a bit of a novelty. But with that came problems too. Like a lot of the young people didn't have the technology in their house. They didn't have laptops. They didn't have space in their rooms. You know, and there maybe was no routine in the house anyway at the moment, you know, because of COVID. So they really struggled with that. So whilst a lot of them engaged at the start, you really started to see the drift within that, you know, after a couple of weeks of the novelty wearing off. And it was probably a wee bit like us too, Work, working from home was maybe great for the first couple of weeks. And then by the third one, you were like, well, I need to get into to the office. Um, so, yeah, it was very different. We had, um, very quickly like got onto the social media and things like that that you, the young people actually used as a way to contact them which was great. Um, but I suppose from the developmental per perspective, in terms of their developmental needs, um, each young person, I suppose, within Candle here has a key worker. So the key worker was really important piece of that, that Jake saw in terms of providing support. So they would have had weekly contact with their key worker who just would have checked in with them and seen what, what was going on with them, what were the issues they were experiencing and what help they needed. And that was really important as part of our response was looking at what they actually needed at that point and how we could help them. And to be honest with you, there wasn't a week that went by that there wasn't issues, whether it be with body image, with anxiety, with not being able to sleep, with um, starting to think that maybe the drugs that you were using recreationally had turned, you know, had, had changed. Um, there was some, you know, some young people who were getting in contact with, with the guards. You know, there was lots going on every single week. Um, and I suppose we were just delighted that the young people were actually sharing it with us and were actually trying to get get some support in the midst of that. Um, I also remember, you know, even the likes of some of the lads in probation, you know, getting a call from one of them one day just out of the blue. And he had been with his mate and his mate wanted to come to Candle. So even moments like that were really good because... Um, at that point, we were limited in what we could do. We were on the phone and we were remotely and we were doing some some meetings as crisis meeting if a young person was in crisis, that one-to-one -one work. So it was lovely to see that even the young people that we were engaged with and that we were sticking with had, you know, referred almost their friend to us because they knew that they were going to get some support um, for what they were going through at that time. So I suppose... You know, that was really good, just trying to look at the young person's needs holistically, whether it be putting in a sleep plan for them. Sometimes it was about getting them a food parcel and making sure they got food for the week. Um, other times it was about trying to talk them through their anxiety, show them different tools on how to, to calm themselves at home. Um, and so it was all of it with the aim of trying to get them to engage in their education. But at that point, I think we realised because, you know, they were really struggling with that remote learning that for a period of time, you know, we had to really focus on their well-being and their emotional well-being um, in that moment as well, you know. But I think just a lot of the work as well is working very closely with Kira's team just in terms of linking in about the young people and making sure that there was a plan in place for whatever young person. And we were very able to do that, very well able to do it between ourselves and, and the probation officers or other services that were involved with the young people. And we were very proactive as well and identifying what young people we were maybe worried about and we felt were potentially likely to re-offend um, and flagging that to try and put a plan in place. So it was really important that we all work together, even though we were very apart in a sense, it was really important that we, that we all work together, I suppose, 
through it as well. We still got referrals. We were still doing assessments. And um, even though they were at a distance and we were still kind of saying to people, you know, you might, you can come in in September. I suppose when we were hoping to be back and I suppose we were back by, by September and it was lovely. Um, the last two weeks of August, we had key working meetings and all 17 of our young people that had left in March, had went out the door in March, were back in August. All of them appeared for their key working meeting and it just really was a testament to us kind of sticking with them and supporting them through, through the COVID, you know, through the main of the COVID pandemic. But I suppose the effects are still ongoing, you know, and I think we'll not really know the true effects of what has happened until maybe you know a year down the line a couple of years down the line but because definitely there's still issues emerging right today that that have started and I think one of the most powerful things I'm gonna I'm gonna end on this but a young person actually said to me today no one is talking about the mental health problems that have come with COVID and being locked down and being socially isolated and I think that that is the main thing for young people today is their mental health and how it has been impacted by I covered. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I think that while we're trying our best to provide and mitigate against the worst extremes of that and support mm. them, I think it's down the down the road in a number of years we're going to see the effects of this big time. Thanks, Alison and Kira. You know, as a probation officer and and working during all this time, and how you've responded, both in terms of. The probation service offices and I suppose with us just mm. yeah I was thinking there as I was listening I suppose early on you know the probation service recognized young people within the service as a priority group and a priority group to be seen because they knew that if we if we relied on phone conversations that they would eventually switch off or that we wouldn't see them we wouldn't lay eyes on them and see what was to be seen and that that connection you spoke about Tom just would break down um, and it's that connection with them that's so important to us. And we do rely on working in partnership with with CDOs such as Candle because um, because of the other services they provide that you've all mentioned there that are very significant for our clients, but also another pair of eyes to, to look at them and another pair yeah. of ears to listen to them. And um, I think that's what was lost so significantly in the last 12, 18 months, really, was, you know, that they weren't going to school, that a lot of services, disability services kind of stopped the face to face. And, you know, a lot of mental health services became online services solely. And, you know, that we had less and less resources to link young people into. And, you know, young people who were actively going to gyms, suddenly gyms shut down. So all of that kind of stress and frustration and, you know, um, for young people, gyms are so significant nowadays. So we really, um, I suppose, felt that in order to, you know, deliver on what we try to do, which is, yes, about uh, ensuring young people comply with court orders. But but what could they do if a young person couldn't attend a, an educational service or an addiction service or what could they do? And. So we really needed, um, you know, the flexibility that Candle provided in helping to, you know, help our young people um, meet what the court had asked for them. But, you know, more importantly, really to try and engage with them to protect them from falling into some of the greater risks that undeniably a lot of them have because they have fallen through the cracks. And I think the importance for the future will be, Brian, having CBOs that we can you know, rely on to work in partnership with to try and repair some of the damage that the, the pandemic has done um, to these young people. I was also thinking, you know, when this struck, you know, normally my team of four probation officers would have one another to talk with about their clients and talk with in person and mull over, you know, challenges and, you know, how could they work with a young person? What could they do? Ideas, debrief. And all of that was kind of lessened throughout the pandemic because we were now working from home and we have been to greater and lesser degrees in offices. But I think to work in partnership with, you know, yourselves around the issues that were coming up for the young people has been very significant when their collegiate support within probation has been lessened really um, unavoidably. The other piece was that, you know, a lot of our young people are in 
are not going to come to offices um, very readily. And so to have community bases from which to interview was very significant. And for us to be able to go out to all of our CBOs and be welcomed in um, throughout the pandemic and to be facilitated with safe interview space was hugely significant because it really helped us keep up the connection with young people and to know that was there. So, you know, there there have been so many positives really that have have come out of of the last 12 months in terms of our relationship with Campbell. Sure, sure. Absolutely. The collaboration has been so significant. So guys, we're just going to finish now. I'm just uh, going to leave the last word with you when, um, because while all this was going on and uh, COVID was happening, Campbell engaged in a further redevelopment that it may have been prophetic in the end, even though it was probably an accident mm. where we developed a therapeutic garden. So you just want to say a word on that and we'll, we'll finish on that. I think couldn't, like you say, it couldn't have happened at a better time. Um, we had spent many years dreaming of a sensory garden that would have a ther- would join in the therapeutic space to have the, another aspect to the work we do with young people. Um, and again, we talked about being a trauma-informed space and how we'd use it. And then when we came back from lockdown, we're going, oh, how much we need to use the outdoor space. And we'd always agreed it would be a place that was not going to be just pretty and, you know, um, a space like an ornament to the space that we always wanted it to be very impactful in the young people's lives. But we've never used that space so much. Um, in a, in a way of bringing young people into a space where they can feel grounded and um, connected with each other and with the earth. And it's very, very healing. We've also never really saw it being used as a space where key working is happening out there. So just even take a, to give someone some breath and away from the restrictions and the oppressiveness of wearing masks all the time, going out in even the cold weather. Um, we've become very hardy. And in fact, we've created a, a loop around the whole building where some of the therapists are bringing young people um, and conducting their therapy, therapy center sessions outside. We've created a space for young people to be able to sit and talk and actually, actually envisage using that space to even have classroom setting. So it's really brought it, you know, I suppose that's the positive in it that the garden has really become a really integral part of how we're going to work with young people not just now i mean it's been a year of it and we see it as being part of our future you know irish people we're not great about hanging around outside but i think we've really um really adapted to that now you know that we can go out even a little the rain has appeared to be softer all the time but um yeah using that space and seeing what an important element it is um, to the work that we do with young people. It's quite phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And it's starting to grow now as well. It's seen those seasons too, isn't it? That little bit of change starting to blossom and it creates an, another, uh, you know, bit of hope in us, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know if anyone else to go on around the garden. I'll go on for hours. I'm just conscious we're out of time, really, guys. I'd love we could go on with this conversation. Um, but Alison and Tom and Kira and Dervla, thank you for joining me today. And uh, thank you to all those uh, beyond our shores uh, who've joined us. And uh, as we say, slow on. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.